Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what I hope will be a very interactive session. Uh, we've got, always got the thrill of a live demo today, which for those of you who've done live demonstrations in the past, you know it can always go one of two ways, but obviously we're, we're hoping for the best, and uh, let's see, see where, where we get to. So this afternoon, uh, myself and Edan, who's the, the uh, CEO and founder of Epiphyte, are going to talk to you about three key elements. Uh, the first is around collaborations between global brands and startup companies. You know, how to make them work successfully. Now, we think that we've had a very successful collaboration over the last few months. The second is around how to take an idea, you know, a concept in people's heads on the, sketched out on a drawing board, to a working proof of concept within 100 days. And that's something which we did and, and are going to showcase for you this afternoon. And then the third piece is about how we then used that uh, proof of concept to then showcase and share with key stakeholders, both within Visa, across some of our bank uh, clients and members, uh, and also with consumers to gather live uh, research and feedback of how uh, a new type of remittance capability could work. So all, all to follow in the next few minutes. Let me first of all just tell you a little about, a bit about Visa Europe Colab. So we are the innovation hub of the European components of Visa Europe. And it's our mission, our passion, if you like, to look at some of the emerging technologies, some of the, the new ideas and thinking to determine some types of competitive differentiation, some new products and services that we could introduce which would give new value to all parties within the, the payments ecosystem that we serve. So we look far and wide. That could just be the banks, but it will also in the future be retailers, consumers, and different parties who engage in that space and domain. Now, it's very important to say, and it's a key element of this conversation this afternoon, is that we recognize we cannot do this alone, that we, Visa Europe, have some real skills and capabilities, uh, but there's also areas which are new for us, and we have been scouring and looking for the very best talents around the startup community and other organizations to collaborate with to really fuse together some of the, the best of breed of what we can bring uh, new organizations and fresh thinking can bring as well. So we're very open to ideas and to collaborations, hence the, the name Visa Europe Colab. The space and domain we work in, we, we sort of think and look at payment ideas, both the next generation, if you like, the evolutionary opportunities. So it could be the next generation of uh, identity and authentication, of contactless, that type of thing but also look at revolutionary ideas as well. And I would, from my perspective at least, uh, the work we've been doing within the blockchain domain and looking at payments and looking at what future things that could offer uh, an organization like Visa definitely falls into the revolutionary space. And a lot of the work that we do, we do in sort of workshops, engagements, really trying to tease out what are the problems and challenges we're trying to solve, both from a business perspective and from a human perspective. Now, what are the things that we could ex explain in plain English so people understand what we're trying to do? Now, even within the payments domain, it is a, a quite a vast area, and we recognize that to be effective, we needed to hone some of our thinking and uh, uh, energy. And what you see on the, the screen behind you are the six key areas of focus that within Visa Europe Colab, we've been putting our time and energy in over the last year. Uh, and I will mention that we only started and set ourselves up uh, just over 12 months ago. And blockchain is an area we're really interested in, really passionate about, and recognize that it does cut across a number of these other themes as well. So we've been exploring some thinking around identity across the blockchain or uh, sort of inclusion opportunities and how that may work with uh, cryptocurrencies in that space. So we're, we're also looking for the interconnectedness. Now, when we, we started putting our time and energy into thinking about uh, some of the, the power and potential of the blockchain and distributed ledger technologies, we, we needed a way of trying to start to concentrate our thinking. And we, the way we did it was we looked across all the growing use cases, both financial and non-financial, and then started prioritizing them in, across the, the landscape visual you see behind me. Uh, and out of those, we started highlighting the, the areas that we were most interest in trying to, to solve first, either because they were adjacent to some of the products and services we offer today, or we could see a natural evolution. And that's what really got us excited and interested around remittances. Now, from a remittance perspective, 
there was a recognition uh, from our innovation unit, there's an opportunity to tap into a future revenue stream, but you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start with some experimentation thinking and some, some concepts and ideas. And so we wanted to look at how we could extend some of the capabilities to new constituents and new parties. And we started off with a very simple premise of saying, could we introduce a remittance service which was both cheaper, quicker, and easier to use from the consumer perspective, but benefited all parties uh, in between? And finally, we recognized the power and strength of uh, the global visa brand and our processing capabilities within the network that we support and serve. But what our sort of long-term vision is to look to see how we could deliver that type of value across other payment networks as well. So to be almost like a network of networks. And what we wanted to, to test in this particular proof of concept is how we could traverse across different payment networks and show how value could be transferred. Now when we started that thinking and we looked across different companies who offered uh, original ideas and thinking in that space, and we're very excited about what we saw with Epiphyte. Uh, Epiphyte, as Ethan will explain in a minute, has some real strong capabilities and some real passion and thinking in this space and domain. And we saw a real opportunity to, to partner together to, to put a proof of concept. And within 100 days, we, we then ran a very effective test, which we engaged different communities to gather feedback as well. I'll just briefly mention before handing over to Eden some of the key things that we learned. Uh, you'll see from the, the demonstration how quick and easy some of the, the work activities were, how we could move our payments across. Uh, but also, we were able to practically demonstrate this network of network effect, where payments were going from a, a simulated uh, Visa account across the Bitcoin network and then arriving in an M, as an M-Pesa text credit. So going across three payment networks. So it was really trying to pull together some, some of those elements that <coughs> gave us the, the power and energy to, to kind of work and operate in this space. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Edan, my partner in this work activities, Thank who's you. going to take us through, uh, talk a bit about Epiphyte and then how the, the proof of concept works. Thank you, John. Um, it's been a real pleasure for Epiphyte to work with uh, Visa, the single largest payment provider in the world, because what Epiphyte does is we're seeking to help financial institutions utilize the permissionless networks that create the blockchain or what we call the interchain, the set of protocols to perform transactions in a more efficient manner. The thing is, we are rapidly coming to expect that payments within a payment system should be basically free and basically instantaneous, even when we're talking about domestic payments, uh, interbank payments. Maybe not here in the US, but definitely in the developed world. And so um, the problem arises when we start trying to do payments between payment systems. If I want to send money from my PayPal to my PayM account, if I want to use a Visa card uh, to transfer money to someone who's got a MasterCard, or if I want to do an international payment. In other words, payments between systems remain expensive, slow, and risky. And so what Epiphyte is utilizing the interchain for is to provide an open standard um, of real value transactions that can be performed as a fabric tying these different uh, payment systems together. And the way we do that is we provide uh, what we call a chain reactor. It has uh, four primary components that we've built up based on customer feedback over the last uh, two years. The first function it provides is a single interface allowing financial institutions to securely um, perform messaging and monitor transactions across multiple different protocols. Bitcoin, <laughs> sorry, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and negotiate transactions across them. At the same time, what we're also providing is transaction routing, finding the best path of execution across different types of vendors or across different types of protocols and locating the liquidity required in order to provide a payment. And then there are the two other components, the bottom side of the screen, which are not transactional but are critical in a regulated financial world. The first is KYC AML, where we're providing two primary functions. The first is the ability to take information from the institution, tie it intrinsically to the transactions that are being performed by the KYC individual or entity on the blockchain, and track their transactional experience even past 
uh, what the institution would usually be able to see, and then also be able to share this information over the blockchain as part of the transaction between institutions, providing a new way of doing fraud monitoring and AML. And the second is we are doing something very complex, performing transactions across multiple jurisdictions and multiple different payment systems, each with their own rule set. And so we create a smart contract governing each and every single one of these transactions and tie them together as a daisy chain of smart contracts such that the entire transaction, instead of settling over three days, executes instantaneously as one transaction. And this is what it looks like and what we're going to show you today. What we've been utilizing this for um, is remittance payments, which are highly complex and expensive payments. In this particular example, a sender wants to take pounds, send them across uh, the world to somebody else who is going to be using Kenyan shillings and do so across three different networks. They're going to initiate the transaction with the Visa network it is going to be converted into, those funds are converted into a digital asset in a way that the customer doesn't have to understand. As far as the customer is concerned, they're only dealing with pounds. And that digital asset is then provided uh, to the m -Pesa network as mobile money. And this whole thing happens in real time. And these are the two big problems we're solving. Um, the first is how do you manage in a pseudonymous system, KYC and AML? And the second is how do we deal with volatility? So, with KYC, we're going beyond what is today possible in best-of-class systems because of the ability to share and the ability of transparency provided by the blockchain. And um, we can provide for KYC and AML information sharing, allowing fraud detection across multiple different institutions. And then in terms of volatility, both the institution and their customers are never exposed to volatility. We're going out and finding market prices before the transaction is executed. The customer knows what is going in and exactly how much is coming out in both of the currencies before it executes. And so what we've managed to achieve here is 85% cost reduction compared to what we're doing today, end-to-end -end tracking, real-time payments where it usually take much, much longer, up to three days, and near global coverage through remittance providers who are already integrated with the blockchain. So let's see uh, what this looks like. So on the right, you'll see um, uh, my uh, phone. I'm going to just log into the app. And here I will be able to select a card. I'm going to choose a, one of my Visa cards. I, you can see my balance. Um, this is not my actual card. This is a test card. Uh, we are not going to be transferring real value today. We do transfer real value, but I know you guys are watching and I know what some of you people are like. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to pay. Uh, we're going to pay uh, to um, Andrew, who's one of our developers in Kenya and actually has an M-Pesa account. And we are going to send, we could send um, any amount. Um, we're going to do 100 and, here we go, 120 pounds. And um, what you're going to see here, um, at the bottom you see a Bitcoin address. Usually we don't expose this to the customer, but we wanted you to be able to see what's happening, so we're exposing it to you. Um, this is a unique address that we have found through our routing mechanism, which is the, uh, provided to us by a particular remittance provider, the one who's going to provide us with best execution. And now I'm going to click send, and um, you can see that the transaction has sent, as far as I'm concerned, to the customer. So let's see what Visa see. So Visa have end-to-end -end tracking, and you can see here the back end. Um, you can see that the current status is funds reserved. Uh, that means that the funds were reserved for the transaction. Um, and we go through several stages in every single transaction. The average uh, settlement time for a transaction is under three minutes. We are actually able to do zero confirmation transactions in Bitcoin and in the other systems. I won't go into how, um, but it's one of our secret sources. And you can see um, that already it's starting to progress. The funds have been locked and the transaction will continue to uh, settle. And probably by the time I'm done, uh, we're done talking here, the transaction will have fully settled. Um, what we're doing here is we're sending for the consumer pounds, it's ending up as Kenyan shillings, and um, we're doing it over three different payment systems in close to real time with live funds. Uh, and what are the next steps for us? What we're now doing in partnership with Visa is we're going to uh, other financial institutions, their Visa's customers, we're working together to integrate it uh, with their systems utilizing the Visa scheme and um, begin uh, pilot rollouts for consumers of these banks. 
to create a truly seamless, instantaneous global payment system. Thank you very much. Please welcome Stephen Pear, BitPay. There we go. Uh, so, uh, thank you. I, I, today I wanted to share just a, a brief update on BitPay's business. Um, we're actually a five-year-old company in the Bitcoin and blockchain space. We actually, almost to the day, we incorporated the company May 31st of 2011. So that makes our team perhaps uh, the oldest and most experienced team in the Bitcoin and blockchain space. So today I wanted to share a few growth stats with you, uh, as well as a few of our recent product innovations. Um, and I'll also have a new product announcement. So I think I have to point over here to get the guy over there to <laughs> move my uh, uh, prompter here. Um, they're on two different systems. Uh, for those of you that might not be familiar with BitPay, um, we are the uh, world's number one Bitcoin payment processor. Uh, we process more transactions every day than uh, all of the other Bitcoin payment processors out there uh, probably combined. We have uh, a suite of tools that allow you to do both payment acceptance as well as payment disbursement. Um, some of you might know us best for our e-commerce tools. In fact, some of you might have even paid for your registration to this conference using our platform. Um, but we also have in-person payment tools. We have solutions for payroll companies. We also have tools that allow people to manage or companies to manage mass payouts all over the globe. We also have business to business billing tools for uh, primarily for supply chain payments. And what a lot of people might not know is we have our own wallet. It's called Copay. Uh, and we believe it's the best wallet platform out there. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about Copay in a minute, but first I wanted to talk about some of our transaction growth over the uh, last few years. So this chart goes back to 2013, uh, and it shows our monthly transaction volumes. It's also, it also has the Bitcoin price overlaid with it. And you can actually see that there's a correlation that when the Bitcoin price takes off, we see a big jump in our transaction processing numbers. So it's kind of the wealth effect where when the price of Bitcoin is higher, it stimulates economic activity. People want to spend their Bitcoins or use their Bitcoins. And so we see it on our platform as a, you can see there in 2013, we had a really sharp run up in, the, uh, uh, in our transaction volumes. Now what happens when the Bitcoin price then stabilizes after that, we see uh, a drop in our transaction volumes, but usually it's a, a mean reversion back to a level that's actually higher than what it was before. And what's happening there is somebody that may have been speculating in the price of Bitcoin, holding Bitcoins as an investment, sees the price go up and decides they want to use it to buy things. And then they do a few transactions and they see how easy it is. And so then they tend to become repeat customers of those businesses. Uh, so as you can see, uh, this chart is only up to March, um, but we have just set a new all-time record in monthly transaction volumes. And you can see many months over the past few years, uh, we've been setting new records in terms of transaction volume. And I expect April will be uh, even higher uh, in a new record. Uh, on average, we process over 4,000 transactions per day and over 100,000 transactions per month. Now, this is small compared to MasterCard and Visa, but for our small team, we're really excited about this. And uh, <laughs> we're a little bit out of sync here. Um, so an another product that, you, that uh, is lesser known, but we've been focusing more on recently, is Bitcoin mass payouts. <clears throat> this product allows you to easily manage, um, a, a company to easily manage um, payments to a large number of recipients all over the globe. So think about app stores where they may need to pay developers that are located all over the planet. Um, the, our solution is much cheaper, much easier to manage, much simpler than the systems that companies are currently having to deal with. 
So we serve some companies, a few examples are a company in Germany that's a payroll processor called Pay, uh, and then a, um, a video game skin marketplace or in-game uh, trading site called Opskins. A lot of people <laughs> trade uh, CSGO items on that site. These platforms, you know, a, a platform like Opskins allows people to make a deposit, trade their swords and their cloaks and whatever, their weapons, uh, and then also withdraw through our platform uh, in Bitcoin. We launched this product in the beginning of 2014, and over the last year, we've seen a 2,600% growth in this, 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 this product. It has a robust pipeline. We have new customers signing up every day uh, and every month, um, and we're really excited and we expect to continue that growth. The next product is B2B billing. Uh, since, and actually, this product we've had since our launch back in 2011. So we've had business to business billing for you know, the entire history, five years. Um, this represents about 10% of our volume. Uh, and it's a very important component of our service offering and one which we're you know, putting more emphasis on and focusing uh, a lot of our efforts recently. Uh, these transactions tend to be about 25 times larger in value than a, a typical consumer transaction. And so that means we can go out and sell businesses that need to do supply chain payments. Maybe it's a company that needs to pay a vendor that's located in another country and they find our platform and our billing solution a much cheaper, much faster, more, and more cost-effective way to get that done. It, it really just simplifies that whole process for these companies. And so we, these companies find tremendous value, especially where cross-border and uh, cross-currency payments are, are involved. So it, it's 10% of our current transaction volume, and we expect that to grow uh, much larger this year. Uh, so one of the segments that we're really excited about as a company is the video gaming segment. Um, we've seen some incredible success here. Uh, it, just in the last year, we've seen seven, a 700% growth in the uh, number of uh, transactions uh, that are somehow related to video gaming. Uh, we now process transactions for the largest and best known uh, gaming platforms, including Wargaming, G2A, and Steam. In fact, we launched Steam last week just last week, um, and, and this segment is really just ideally suited for Bitcoin payments. You tend to have a customer base there that is young and often doesn't have bank accounts. So this makes it very easy for them to buy their games. Uh, in the case of Steam, it allows them to top up their Steam account and then buy whatever video games on the Steam platform. And just to give you an idea of the significance of this, um, a lot of people refer to Steam as the iTunes of video gaming. It's really big. And you know, one of the really cool things is my, my kids just think it's cool. Uh, so they're, they're really excited about it. Um, so we're starting to see this network effect among these different game companies. So uh, companies can now start to integrate with one another in their payment system more directly. So somebody can sell a sword on one site and then use those Bitcoins to then deposit and make a purchase of a game on another site. I said Steam was the iTunes of video gaming. Uh, I've challenged my team to sign up the iTunes of iTunes. Um, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> so that's video gaming. Um, I mentioned Copay earlier. This is our wallet platform. Uh, we launched this a year ago. Um, and we're really excited. I think uh, you know this is uh, one of the best wallets, if not the best wallet in the space. And uh, it's got a number of unique features that are not found in other wallet applications. First of all, it's got a, a fantastic user interface. Um, we've tried really hard to simplify it to make every button work, every, every operation as simple as possible to really step back and do a lot of user acceptance testing and make sure this product is just as simple as we can possibly make it. One of the features that it has that not a lot of other, or I don't know if any other uh, wallet application has, is that you can actually have multiple wallets. You can have a wallet that stores your personal funds, you can have a wallet that stores your business funds, um, and so you can create as many wallets in a single application as you want. Now, in addition to being a great single user wallet, Copay is also a multi-user wallet. So this means you can create 
wallets with shared funds. So think about if you want to have your family manage funds together. Uh, or you want to curate your child's spending. So I mentioned the gaming space. You can actually create a shared wallet with your child and see what they're spending online. Uh, or a business could use it to securely manage their corporate treasury as, as we do at BitPay. So one great feature of Copay is that you can buy or sell Bitcoin directly from within the application. We introduced this a few months ago with a company called Gladera. And just a couple weeks ago, we've added uh, Coinbase. So if you have a Coinbase account, you can link it to your co uh, Copay wallet. And you can very easily, with just a few clicks or touches uh, uh, of a button, uh, buy or sell Bitcoin. Since we launched Copay, we've steadily improved Copay with the objective of adding about one you know, great new feature every month or so. Um, and, and today, I really am confident in saying that Copay really is the best wallet platform out there. Um, you, it's really fantastic. You should just you should go check it out. It's in all the app stores. Uh, you can go to copay.io and install it. It works on every desktop and mobile operating system out there. So check it out. So I mentioned we were going to announce a new product. Uh, since we started BitPay uh, five years ago, uh, we've prided ourselves on giving people more ways to use their Bitcoin. Because we believe that if you can use Bitcoin in more ways, it, it makes Bitcoin itself more valuable. So um, a lot of people say that by adding new merchants, you're inducing people to sell their Bitcoins and it drives the price down. But it's actually just the opposite. Um, if you have more ways that you can use Bitcoin, more people are interested in actually holding and using Bitcoin. So we do recognize, though, that it's going to take some time before all businesses start accepting Bitcoin. And we want to make it even easier to use Bitcoin, uh, even at companies that might not already accept it. So uh, today, we're launching the BitPay Visa debit card. With this card, users can instantly convert Bitcoin to US dollars and spend anywhere that Visa is accepted. It's compatible with all Bitcoin wallets, so you don't need a special account at some exchange uh, to link up with this card. You can use any, it's any of the Bitcoin wallets that are out there, your favorite one. It also comes with a great mobile user interface for managing the card. Uh, in fact, we think it's the best mobile experience of any card program, Bitcoin or otherwise. The best part is that it's free to load value using Bitcoin onto the debit card. Uh, so the Bit BitPay Visa debit card is available starting today in all 50 states. Uh, you can visit bitpay.com slash visa to get started. Um, and that's our update of BitPay. So thank you all. And I think there might be a couple minutes for any questions. Are we doing questions? Oh. I don't know if we have a microphone or. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've known with other cards there's been issues with the US having a uh, for loading and for maintenance. Is there any maintenance fees with the BitPay card? No. Uh, we have on the website a whole schedule of the fees. Um, no. As far as I know, there's, there's a fee to, to, uh, to start the card program. There are fees with accessing an ATM. Um, but aside from that, no, loading Bitcoin is, we, we intentionally wanted to make that free of charge. Any other questions? No. We can take one more question. OK. solution and most of the Visa solution include international? Uh, no, it's only in the uh, 50 U.S. states today, uh, as of right now. And also the payroll solution that you have is only U.S.? Oh, the payment solutions, no. The we, payroll, we payroll. The, oh, payroll. Payroll. Uh, no, those are uh, available in North America, South America, and Europe primarily. Actually, probably a few other countries outside of those regions. Um, um, talk to us. That's, that, that particular product, um, it depends on the country and the licensing requirements, whether or not that's available. Our payment processing product is available in all those regions. Our payouts and pay, payment disbursements depends on you know, particular uh, licensing requirements that we have. I think that was it. All right, thank you.
Please welcome Bill Barheit, Abra. Okay, so um, I'd like to spend maybe five or six minutes giving you an update on what's happening at Abra, and then take uh, maybe 10 minutes for, for questions. Uh, and so I'm gonna just kind of jump right into it. I wanna uh, show you what's been working uh, and give you a little bit of uh, uh, a little a bit of a look behind or underneath the uh, the hood as to how Abra works, and and then give you an update as to uh, what's coming this year, and like I said, then then take some questions. So as a reminder, we started Abra for one reason and one reason only. We wanted to make it instant, free, and effectively real time to send money from one phone number in the world to any other phone number. And that's the only reason that we started the company. We couldn't figure out how to do this. Um, it turns out that there's no really easy way for the average consumer to do this today. That remains the case, since we're not live everywhere yet. Uh, and uh, this is our singular uh, uh, mission at Abra, is to solve this problem. And we want to make it possible to solve this problem whether you have a bank account or whether you don't have a bank account. So the Abra product, as it exists today, basically does all of these things. It allows you to send and pay globally. It's real digital cash, and I'm gonna give you a look behind the scenes as to how the digital cash and our synthetic currency model works. It's an iOS and Android-based cash wallet. We do not store consumer funds at Abra. I have no access to the private keys on your phone. You are holding your own funds with Abra. We're not a hosted wallet. It's not Coinbase with hedged funds. It's not uh, uh, another you know, circle type service with hedged funds. You are literally managing your own digital cash directly on your phone. You're not taking foreign exchange risk, which I'll explain to you how that works. You can buy and sell digital cash for purposes of depositing and withdrawing funds in cash via Abra tellers or via your bank account. And I'll show you for the first time how that works. Um, and it's as private as paper cash in the sense that um, you're holding your own keys. And Abra tellers have the ability to, to earn funds. And I'll give you an update as to, as to where we are with that. So on your, um, on your left, that is a map. I actually made this, uh, my team made this map on Saturday. I think that's Manila. Uh, those are live tellers operating right now in the Manila area. We currently have uh, over 1,500 tellers live in the app today with a massive backlog of, of tellers. I'll tell you up front, the biggest challenge that we have as a company right now is onboarding tellers. They're coming at us fast and furious. Um, and I'll give you some stats that, that, that'll make the problem even a little bit more daunting, although I think we have a solution to the problem. Um, so these are, are uh, exactly how the user sees the app today. Um, where the countries that we're live, it, suppose, it supports both buying and selling of currency via your bank account, uh, as well as um, using the, the cash tellers that you see on the, on the screen. So basically, uh, the sender can buy digital currency, they can send digital currency, and the recipient can sell digital currency. All three processes basically use Bitcoin blockchain in the same way, completely transparent to the consumer. They don't have to understand what's going on behind the hood. Okay, so again, Adding money is simply buying digital currency, sending money is sending digital currency, and withdrawing money is selling digital currency either back to your bank accounts or in cash at a teller. So now I wanna give you a quick look behind the scenes at what's going on, which we don't talk about very often, uh, and then I'm gonna um, give you an update on our launch, and then I'll take some questions. Okay, so there's big, three big tech challenges in making Abra work, right? We wanna make it possible to not have to know anything about public-private key cryptography, anything about Bitcoin wallets, but be able to send dollars from here and have euros land over here, right? And if you have $10 here that's worth 12 euros here, it darn well, it darn well better be 12 euros uh, two days from now if it's, if it's still in my pocket, meaning I'm not taking any, any volatility. And I better give the consumer lots of easy ways to get that money on and off my phone, uh, regardless of where the app is being used. So the first way we solve this problem is uh, with two products that we created, both are live now, Abra Send, which is the ability to send money from any, any phone number to any other phone number, and Abra Pay, which uses the same consumer wallet to send money to any other, any merchant. Our merchant wallet basically works the same way as the consumer wallet, except it's a multi-sig wallet running on a server. There, 
therein we also have no access to the merchant's funds. Uh, we simply give them way to manage their own liquidity in and out of their wallet to their bank account. Okay, so on the consumer side, again, the funds can land in any currency the system supports. Um, and with effectively real-time uh, currency exchange uh, through the network, and AbraPay uses the same model for currency exchange. Uh, the beauty of the AbraPay model, of course, is, is that it handles real-time foreign exchange, uh, and because it settles as a cash transaction, from the merchant's perspective, there are no chargebacks. The, of course, the merchant can enable whatever kind of return policies they want, but that's independent of uh, the traditional uh, card acquiring model for, for chargebacks. Okay. So Abra Cash. So this is, we, we liken this to the world's first synthetic digital dollar. A digital dollar means in our world that there's no paper in a vault. Okay? So this is counterintuitive, right? So the analog is I hand you $100 worth of gold and I probably hand you something like a put option on the gold at the same time that fixes the value of that gold at whatever its strike price was at the moment I hand it to you. Okay? How in the world do you do this in um, some digital currency without ABRA becoming God knows what from a regulatory perspective. So this was one of the big um, difficult problems that we solved a couple of years ago that led to the, to the creation of ABRA. The idea is to basically use Bitcoin as the underlying asset and then use smart contracts or scripts directly on the Bitcoin blockchain that effectively tie the value of that um, uh, Bitcoin to the strike price at the moment that the, that the um, Stored value is created so that if the consumer perceives they're holding $100 in 36 hours, if the price of Bitcoin has gone up 10%, they're still holding $100. And if it's gone down by 10%, they're still holding $100. Okay? And the redemption and, and instantiation of those contracts is, is uh, a core part of what ABRA has developed to make this work um, behind the scenes. So the third part of this is the liquidity management aspect of this. So in addition to what the consumer sees on the screen, Behind the scenes, we have been working tirelessly for the past two years to build cash in and cash out mechanisms all over the world. I've circled the globe four times in like the last nine months, I can tell you personally, just meeting with, with companies all over the world who are signing up to become uh, master teller partners in our network. And the response has been awesome. So you see here that there are several methods that we're supporting. We're taking different approaches for different markets, right? Some countries are mostly unbanked consumers and in those markets, we're focusing our efforts very heavily on uh, the cash teller networks. Some markets, for example, in most of Western Europe are very heavily uh, bank consumers, and we're focusing most of our efforts there on using the existing banking infrastructure. The US, the US is a mix, which is unique, and so we're gonna be doing both. Um, eventually, every market will have all of the options, uh, but in order to um, get live expediently, um, we're going with what each market um, needs most in order to have a good um, user experience. But the idea is to have as many high quality, good experience ways to buy and sell digital currency into and out of your app as quickly as possible. Okay, so where are we today? So we have been live uh, testing the service for several months with uh, thousands of consumers. Uh, the feedback has been awesome. Uh, we're getting a lot of usage with uh, people who use the, uh, the app for uh, private listing services vis-a-vis -vis Craigslist in, in other countries. Um, and the sellers uh, love it. The, the buyers no longer have to deal with COD or waiting in line. Uh, and these are person-to-person -person transactions. Um, we added, um, after launch, a request payment function to uh, address the needs of that market. And uh, people really like that function a lot. Um, generates a push notification back to the, to the buyer who then agrees to the, to the transaction, which then signs the the transaction and publishes the send to the, um, to the initial seller. We've had pre-registrations for tellers now in well over 90 countries. And as I mentioned, uh, we've put a process in place, which I believe um, start, starting later this year will quickly allow us to start to deploy those tellers, um, doing that in a way that marries with uh, a global liquidity system um, was, was non-trivial, but I think, I think we've got it under control. Um, and the interest in the AbraPay model for cross-border commerce has been awesome. Um, and so we're, we're now testing our, our first merchants there. So uh, our goal in 2016 is, is it's, uh, it's real. It's, it's, I wouldn't exactly say it's uh, non-aggressive, but our goal is to be live globally this year. That means that there shouldn't be a country in the world outside of countries that are prohibited um, by the US government for us to be live. 
uh, where we wouldn't be live. Um, and that means send and receive across all countries globally. Uh, there will be some countries where we don't support the local currency, and they'll have to use ABRA in dollars, euros, or some other country, or some other currency, excuse me. And our goal will be to backfill those local currencies as quickly as, quickly as we can. And um, like I said, there'll be a combination of different types of bank and, and cash-based uh, tellers for liquidity um, in the system. So we are set up outside. It's hard to show like two or three or four phones at once. So come find us, and we're happy to show you a live demo of how ABRA works. Um, and we can, if you bring your phone, I'll, I'll show you how to get it set up yourself uh, in the meantime. And I have, I think, like five or six minutes to answer questions. So I'd be happy to, to do that right away. Yeah. 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 So I was. Uh, the question was, how do you address the knucklehead problem? Yeah. Um, the the person that looks at the ABRA application and says, "Hey, they have cash. I'm going to rob them." Yeah. Like, how do you address that? And are most of your tellers uh, brick and mortar now at right. this moment? So there there are two types of tellers in the system. Uh, one is what we call the master teller network, and these are partners who have dozens, hundreds, or in some cases thousands of stores where they run uh, out of a central wallet the ability to buy and sell uh, digital cash at each point of sale. We have very little concerns about you know, them robbing the consumer. Then we have the individual teller. The individual teller vetting process is part of what I alluded to before. And one of the first questions that we ask the individual teller is, how do you make money today? Right? Are you in a cash business today? Right? So for example, prepaid wireless airtime is something that I believe is is um, driving a lot of those early registrations because that's a way that people know that, that they're making money. And we estimate that there's 30 million people out there today making money in some way buying and selling wireless airtime. It marries very well with the, the teller model. So that's part of the vetting process. Are you in a cash business today? No, well, then you're probably not a good teller for Abra. And we will self-select people in or out based on a lot of those filters. Um, and then there's other things we're doing in certain countries like in the US in order to meet FinCEN requirements that are unique to the US, which we'll, which we'll be announcing soon. Because most individual tellers in the US would never have heard of FinCEN. And so we have to address that problem for them, because obviously we're not going to enable anybody to go to jail. Right? And we want them to have a great experience and make money at the same time. So, Sure. Can you reveal some more details about the Bitcoin uh, blockchain smart contract you, you use for uh, value stability? Because we heard a lot about, about smart contracts on Ethereum and stuff, but on the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, the, the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the expressivity of the script language is very uh, tying, and uh, mm -hmm. we are very interested in the. Well, the good news for Abra is, is that the Bitcoin scripts really only enable one function. They're not meant to be Turing complete. But they do exactly what we need, which is they enable the automation of Bitcoin from a private key output to a public key input. Once you have that and you can script that, you can do what you need if you know how to do it. And then there's a, it's, it's a complicated discussion, but there's a pricing oracle, which then determines the price. And our goal over time is to decentralize that more and more via our liquidity management system so that there's no named third party oracle. The network itself is setting the price. Bitcoin is not liquid enough yet for that to be a viable thing to do, but I think it will be at the rate it's going, and Abra will decentralize that piece of the pie more and more and more over time. Um, 